Attack on Titan Season 4, Episode 1. Well, it's finally here. The final season of Attack on Titan has arrived, and if you're a manga reader like me, you might feel a little worried. 16 episodes seems like a grossly low amount to cover what has been told in the story from where Season 3 left off to where we currently are in the manga. A part of me hopes that only the first part is 16 episodes, and the second part will be an additional 16 episodes. Either way, I'm hoping for the best. The first thing we see is a bird flying. Immediately I thought of the scout regiment, the wings of freedom. The contrast that exists between the free flying bird with the young boy on the ground in the middle of a battlefield. The exact opposite of freedom. The boy tells the bird to get away and we see the effects of warfare, bodies surrounding the boy. Contrast the beginning of this new season with the end of season 3. At the end of season 3 we get this picturesque scene of the characters on the beach, wondering what's on the other side of the ocean. An idea that has been around since very early on in the story. This idealized mindset of what the world is like beyond the waters. But Aaron knows that there are enemies there. And where there are enemies, there is war. Interesting how that final scene of the last season showed two birds soaring in the sky. And then season 4 begins, showing us that world on the other side of the water. Fighting. Death war. No different is the land beyond the water from the land from which the characters reside. The grass is certainly not greener on the other side. The boy's name is Falco, and we find that out when his older brother Colt finds him on the battlefield and carries him back to safety. This whole beginning scene gave a very World War I or World War II vibe, and it's safe to say that if you want to make a comparison between the setting and the anime in relation to real life history, then this anime is roughly the early to mid 1900s. Falco's brief loss of memory serves to explain to the viewer what is going on. They've been at war for four years. A time skip has happened. Marley is at war with the Mideast Allied Forces, and a new female character explains that if they destroy their naval fleet, it will result in a victory for Marley. But to do that, they have to take Fort Slava. Not the easiest task, as it seems to be quite fortified. The other two characters are Zofia and Udo. Zofia reminds me a little of Annie with her monotone demeanor, and Udo seems like he could pass as Hanji's son, especially with him serving as comic relief in this scene. Falco asks what they are doing on the front lines, and female Aaron says that they are here to be judged on who will be the next warrior, the successor of the armored titan. With this time skip, in conjunction with the fact that we know warriors titans can only live for 13 years, we know that Reiner's days are numbered and a successor must be found. At first, I thought, wow, Marley, what a great nation sending young teens to war. But then I remembered how Aaron and his friends were all quite young when they started their training and had their first battle with the Titans. Then the opening theme plays. At first, I disliked it. And to be honest, after listening and watching it again a few more times, I can comfortably say I'm not a fan. The song is fine, but the opening lacks visuals. When I think of Attack on Titan openings, I think of action, color schemes, amazing transitions. This one felt lacking, empty. And is that what we're supposed to feel? Because they are in war. This is the final war, the final arc. And it's not like it's going to be all sunshine and rainbows by the end with everyone surviving. I mean, this is the final season though. It needs to go out with a bang. But who knows, maybe I'm just being negative about it and was spoiled by all the previous openings this anime had. I love how they kept the same episode number and title screen. That made me happy. We find out that female Aaron's actual name is Gabby. I call her that because she has that similar confidence in her ability and goals that Aaron has. She shows her confidence with regards to who will be chosen as the successor to the armored titan. Aaron's ambition to slaughter every titan in order to bring peace to his people is similar to Gabby's desire to slaughter everyone on paradise to show that Eldians are not all evil. They both have the same goal, liberty and freedom for themselves and their people. This puts it right out there, as if it already hasn't been obvious enough throughout the series. That Attack on Titan is not some linear story with black and white characters that are clearly good and clearly evil. Perspectives play a role, and that's what I've loved about this story. You can justify or demonize virtually every character's decisions. But Gabby's not all talk. She has put together a bunch of explosives and presents a Cheshire Cat-like grin. Just as this happens, Colt is trying to convince Commander Magath that they cannot destroy the machine guns without running to certain death. Colt suggests that they should use the Jaw and Cart Titans. This is where the Marleyan army has had significant advantage over their enemies. They have Titan warriors at the ready. But Magath disagrees because the enemy has anti-Titan weaponry. Further showing that the era of Titans is coming to an end, enemies have adapted and developed weaponry that can successfully combat Titans. Colt tries to explain that the odds of the enemy successfully hitting one of the Titans at the nape is incredibly low, but Magath retorts simply with, and if they did, 
Magath is a true commander, one that does not want to take unnecessary risks, especially when it comes to weaponry that is priceless for the Marlian army, because that's all the Titans are to the Marlians, weapons to be used. If a warrior dies on the battlefield, there is no guarantee that the powers will be passed on to the successor if they were to consume them. I honestly don't know if consuming a dead warrior would result in the powers passing on, and since nobody is dumb enough to bother trying that, it appears that a situation like that will never be tested. Magath makes reference to the beginning of the anime with the initial attack on Shinganshina nine years ago, where very close to 13 years. The power of the titans is what sets Marley apart from its enemies. They cannot be careless when it comes to ensuring the safety of that power. With that, Magath orders the Eldian unit to attack. Colt attempts to prevent it but is cut off by Magath who simply calls him Eldian. This othering, this prejudice that Marleans have towards Eldians is even existent within the ranks of the Marleyan military. Although they are supposed to see each other as brothers and sisters in arms, there is certainly a hierarchy. And the Eldians are seen as nothing else but sinners, whose only purpose is to be used for the benefit benefit of Marley. This is where we see the true effects of warfare, PTSD, a soldier shaking, knowing that not only death, but a brutal and violent death is imminent, shaking, unable to control himself or even react to the fly on his face. He can only pray. Full of fear, they stand at the command of their superior, but not all are able to. The Eldians are expendable. If they die, they die. The Marleans have no care for the Eldians, except for the warrior titans and the ones they are judging to be potential warriors. This is exemplified by the suicide unit, with literal bombs strapped to their bodies to make it known that their death has no meaning but to advance the military interests of the empire that they serve. A man looks at a picture of his wife now that he knows he will never see her again. Even with all their training and discipline, it's hard to remain stoic and ready for battle when you know that not only is death coming but also that your superiors will not even think twice about your death if even once. Magath orders the warrior candidates to stand by, and it is revealed to the viewer that Colt is the successor for the Beast Titan, which currently belongs to Zeke. Using her charisma and confidence, Gabby is able to convince Magath to let her try and disable the enemy's tanks. She really has the gift of the gab. <laughs> Get it? Gift of the gab. Okay. This shot right here really reminded me of Eren. The conviction and ambition pouring out from her eyes. Perspective, people. This is the season of perspectives. Falco blushes as Gabby takes off her uniform, hinting that he may have feelings for her beyond that of a friendship. Here are two of possibly the worst soldiers ever. They fall for the classic innocent civilian tactic. They even notice that she's dragging something and they still don't do anything. Great tactic by Gabby. She can talk the talk and walk the walk. Both of the soldiers are hesitant to shoot and just as one is about to do it, Gabby falls over. Great acting. 10 out of 10. This gives her more time and she's able to wait it out until the tanks arrive and then she's able to dispose of them. Her comrades look on in amazement and Magath calls for Galliard. One of the soldiers is still alive and starts shooting at Gabby. Falco doesn't even hesitate to go and protect her. They are both saved by the Jaw Titan, Galliard. Look at how the bullets from the enemies are able to penetrate the Jaw Titan's face, showing once again that weaponry has advanced and that the Titans do not hold the same advantage over their enemies as they once did. We see drugged Eldians in straitjackets about to be deployed for the airborne assault. We can all guess what's about to happen. I wonder who these people are. For the sake of what little ethics Marley has, I really hope they are criminals and not just regular Eldians that weren't fit to fight. Then we get our first look at Zeke. He is the spear and Reiner is the shield. We get the classic information available for public disclosure. I always enjoyed these and I always have to fumble around for my remote to pause it so I can read it all. This scene reminded me of the beaches of Normandy. Artillery firing at waves of soldiers pushing forward with bodies piling up. Many Eldians still died even though Gabby took that huge risk to prevent them from having such a loss. I hope in the next episode we'll know how many of the 800 soldiers of the Eldian unit died just so we can know how many lives Gabby was able to save. The Eldian soldier in fear as he looks at the carnage in front of him. Then then transitioning to the Jaw Titan pursuing two Mid-East Allied Forces soldiers who are full of fear shows that war is brutal and destructive for both sides. Both the Allies and enemies are overwhelmed by fear and rightfully so. The Cart Titan then arrives with some heavy artillery. Falco retrieves an enemy soldier and attempts to provide first aid. This abides by the rules of war. You don't kill an enemy that has surrendered or given up the fight. Gabby is quick to note that this may be Falco's way to show off how much he abides by the rules and therefore showcasing why he would be the right successor for the Armored Titan. But Falco says he doesn't care. He's not doing this to further his own ambitions. He's doing it because it's the right thing to do. His sense of justice here reminded me of Armin. The injured enemy is mumbling and Udo is able to translate. Even as Falco is doing a good deed, he's referred to as a devil. Both their superiors and their opposition show prejudice towards the Eldians. And their superior commander finds this moment to be comical, further showing Marleyan's lack of empathy for Eldians. The drugged Eldians are released from the aircraft and Z yells to transform them into titans. They are expendable. They don't matter. Colt cries as he witnesses his people being used as nothing but pawns in warfare. 
This displays his care for his people. Contrasting with the earlier statement by Magath regarding how Colt needs to learn how to lead, this moment showed that Colt has inherent leadership characteristics. A leader is someone that cares for their followers. Right now, Colt appears to have far more care for his followers than Magath. The Titans have descended on the enemy, and even though weapon advancements have been made to combat the Titans in a more efficient manner, the fear of Titans remains the same. As we see from the different frames in this scene, there are many Titans that didn't even survive the descent, used merely as objects to smash the enemy. The Marleyan officer views them as devils and is reminded about how his ancestors were killed the same way. But that happened years ago. It's only through propaganda and nationalism that causes these Marleyans to project the hate that they have for the Eldians of the past towards the innocent Eldians of the present. The new weaponry can easily decimate these average titans, but just as they are getting picked off, the shield makes his descent. Reiner sees the weaponry and knows he has to destroy them. They are on the walls, and he's reminded of his past. His PTSD and enormous feelings of regret remains with him constantly. He can't forget his past. He's haunted by it. Another group of tanks arrive, and they are easily able to destroy Reiner's left arm, but he makes quick work of them. Just as Reiner is about to be attacked, Galliard saves him. They've taken the fort, and Zeke makes his descent. He relents that it is their fault that the war has happened. It's because they failed their previous mission. Zeke winds up for the pitch to take out the naval fleet, but the fleet sends an attack his way. With no time to dodge, he seems helpless, but Reiner, the shield, protects him. Now Zeke, the spear, is able to destroy the naval fleet, ending the four-year war with a Marleyan victory. However, all is not well in Marley. The world knows that the era of Titan domination is coming to an end, and Marley needs to obtain the power of the founding Titan as soon as possible. Throughout the episode, anime-only viewers may have been wondering, where the hell is Eren and everyone else? But by the end, we are hinted that they may be closer than we expected. I enjoyed the ending theme. I think it fits quite well, and I can only hope that I'll start liking the opening in the future. But thanks for watching. This took quite a while to write and make. I always think it's going to be a quick thing, but it ends up taking hours to write and edit it all. So if you made it this far, I highly appreciate it. I'm going to try and do this with every episode because I always enjoy digging deep into the complexities and multi-layered nature of stories I enjoy. If you haven't liked and subscribed, please do so. It helps me out tremendously. Please let me know what you thought about the episode down below. I'd love to hear from you. And if you want to interact with me further, I'm on Twitter and also live on Twitch every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday. Links are in the description. Hope to see you there. And as always, I'll see you on the flip side.